What about our attire? What about our attire? And uh, just in thinking ahead, this is something I do from time to time. Got a thought on my mind or something that I'm studying. I go ahead and put something out on Facebook, get a little feeler, and I put on Deuteronomy 22, 5. And uh, just verse, no comments, no opinions, just a verse. And I uh, certainly got some, uh, some people upset. No, not really upset, surely not. But, <laughs> but it, two people asked me questions. But I was getting ready to talk about this. That's why I was even thinking about that. And two honest questions from folks in our church. Uh, one person was uh, an older lady, and she was talking about the subject of ladies wearing pants. And so she's like, you know, I want to do right with the Lord. Actually, both of them basically asked the same question. One was an older lady and one is younger. But they said they want to do what's right with the Lord. Uh, but there are certain situations that they get in where they find themselves wearing pants. And so they're like, well, is that wrong? You know, what about wearing pants under a skirt or something like that? Is there, what's wrong with that? And so they had a lot of questions. And I said, well, this... Uh, hopefully will help you out uh, with what I'm going to preach uh, Sunday afternoon. So uh, the, the whole idea is about our attire or our, uh, our clothing, uh, just a different, uh, what's the other word I'm looking for, apparel, you know. And here's the thing about this, okay, whether it comes to the music you listen to, the clothes you wear, you know, whether or not you watch TV, uh, man, I'm just, there are a whole bunch of things that you could consider part of your standards, okay, your own personal standards. Now, you should have your own personal standards for yourself. You know, if you're the uh, head of the household, uh, you got your own personal standards for your family, no doubt. If you're the boss somewhere over some company, you got your own personal standards as to how the people should be conduct, conduct themselves in there. And uh, we all have a, a, a different responsibilities, but primarily we're responsible for ourselves and having our own personal standards. And I, could, and I think of a personal standard as something like uh, an equalizer. I think I'm using the right word. Okay, I'm not a sound man, that's for sure. If you ever come to one of our services in Iola, you'll realize not a sound man. But uh, there's a soundboard in the back of the church and uh and they've just got all these little knobs and adjustments and and uh you know you just gotta you gotta know what you're doing back there but there's certain things you know certain frequencies or or uh you know maybe there's too much reverb and you gotta bring that back and the whole idea is so that everyone that's listening to it right gets the best out of that experience they can un they can hear it the best you know the clearest and, uh, and I think about that sometimes when it comes to our personal standards, like we should always be adjusting, like it's according to where we are, what we're doing, who's around, all these kind of, the, there's certain things that are going to have to be adjusted and just constantly tweaked in our life, you know, trying to get to that, that right place. What's the best, you know, that we can do, the best that we can perform, to perform, okay? And, uh, and yes, it's not uh, a bad thing to perform, <laughs> Right? We're performing unto the Lord. We're performing for others who might, uh, you know, we might be able to give the gospel to, or whatever. That's not a bad. Uh, that's not a bad word. All right. So when it comes to our clothing, there's a lot of questions. A lot of people get scared. You know, if someone's going to tell me how to dress and and all that, and and that's certainly not my my intention. But we do want to look at what does the Bible say. And I do want to just think about this and how to build these personal standards. Okay. Now I thought about this about four different types of clothing that we might wear uh, as far as uh, uh, the occasions that we might wear them. First of all, we have clothes that we wear around the house, all right? Our PJs or whatever, our comfy, just maybe call them house clothes or whatever. I'm at the house, I'm not going anywhere, you know, nobody but my family around, so these are my comfortable clothes that I'm going to wear. Uh, you know, some people wear those to Walmart, but really, they're house clothes. <laughs> <laughs> their own clothes. But anyway, that's another <laughs> that's another message for another day. Then you have just what I was just say, your plain clothes. I'm going out in the public, but I'm not there's just nothing special about the day, right? This is just my plain everyday clothes. Or some people might say street clothes, I think, or you know, whatever, just my plain clothes. I would say, you know, it's gonna be a step up from your house clothes probably. They're not they're not your super comfy clothes. Although, you know, I'm finding the older I get, the more I'm like, eh, I'm more about comfort than, 
than how I look, right? I want to be able to go out and be comfortable. And this is why I can see why when they get older, they're all about the, you know, the elastic pants and they pull them up here and they, you know, who cares anymore? I just want to be comfortable. <laughs> I'm getting there, okay? Just give me some time. But there's plain clothes, street clothes, whatever you want to call it. Then there are work clothes. Now, that's obviously going to vary depending on what you do, right? If you are a mailman, you've got certain clothes that you wear. Depending on the job that you're doing, certain kind of clothes, uh, flipping uh, uh, burgers at fast food joint or whatever, you probably had a uniform. It doesn't matter what you're doing. There's uniforms. There's, uh, if there's not a uniform, you got your own business or whatever, there's probably something uh, that you consider your work clothes. Me, in a manner of speaking, when I stand up here to preach and I have this, this is my work clothes, if you want to look at it that way. But that leads me into the next one, which would be our dress clothes, right? Most people have something that they would consider dress clothes. I think there are some that just forego that altogether. It doesn't matter if they're going to a wedding or they're going to a special banquet, special occasion, whatever. They don't really care. They always wear the same thing. But you understand what I mean. There are, this is a type of clothes you might wear for an occasion. You would dress up, you know. Incidentally, uh, most preachers dress clothes kind of the same thing. In fact, a lot of people, when they go to church, just say, I'm just going to wear my dress clothes. You know, I'm just going to wear my good clothes for going out. They're not my comfy clothes that I wear around the house. You know, how some of you guys have met Ben at, uh, uh, in Iola. Ben is, is got something. I don't know what he's got, but he's, he's meant he got some mental issues. And, uh, and anyway, oh, we're dealing with him and a lot of different things. And all of a sudden he started coming, uh, to church in his pajamas. I mean, just pajamas, pajamas. Uh, you know, a little chest hair sticking out up here, and then he's got to <laughs> And I'm like, Ben, you know, I don't want to be ugly or anything like that, but this is, you're coming to church, man. You don't need to be in your pajamas, right? You know, show some respect for God. And he's like, oh, but they're just comfy. And then I can go home and go straight to bed. And I'm like, no, it's, it's not about you, right? And you might be like, well, that's rude, man. You shouldn't be telling somebody how to dress in church, whatever. Uh, I'm just saying that probably how we dress at church might be a little different than what we wear around the house. You know, there's probably nothing wrong with having a little bit of a standard on that for ourselves. And in his case, nobody's there to set a standard for him, so somebody has to make a suggestion. You know, somebody has to help him out a little bit. A lot of people never had a dad to show them, uh, you know, what it means to dress up and how you got to have a, you know, where exactly does the tie lie on you? You know, does it go under the belt, above the belt? The, you know, there's, there's different, you know, general rules about how to, uh, don't take it from me, I got white socks on this morning, but <laughs> my wife's having a fit over here. You know, it's, it's just, I, did, I had a rough morning. But anyway, there are rules, you know, and parents teach their kids that. Some people don't, they never learn that. So it's okay to say, hey, this is how somebody dresses up. Or if you don't have this type of article of clothing, let me help you. I'll buy that for you. Just, these are just some general ideas about clothes. But obviously, none of my opinions matter. We want to see what does the Bible say. And the Bible is not going to be super uh, 100% accurate to our culture today. Okay, Not everything we wear today looks just like it looked like back in the Bible days. And so not everything's compatible. But really, let me just think of it. Let me just explain it this way. Let's forget for a second. Using the principles that we're going to look at in the Bible, we'll forget about everything that happened like what was a tunic? What did they wear underneath the tunic? You know, what were the bre what were breeches? You know, were they were they pants? Were they short pants? Were they uh, just underwear? You know, what was what was what was the overcoat and all that? Let's just pretend there's absolutely no evidence out there because there's very little anyway as to what everybody was wearing, you know, in the Bible days. Okay, it's it's really not relative too much. We just want to know the principle. But right now what we want to see is what do we look like today. And I want to give you four uh, principles of things we need to consider. And I'm going to look at the Bible principles on this. When we, when we are going to decide what it is that we wear, whether it's comfy clothes, plain clothes, work clothes, dress clothes, still there's going to be these things that we have to consider based on the Word of God. Okay, number one is this. Does, do they how do they cover your nakedness? Okay, we're going to look at those, how they cover your nakedness. Number two would be this, are they gender specific? And there's that Deuteronomy 22, 5 verse that everybody got upset about. Uh, gender specific, what does that mean? We'll talk about that for, uh, in a minute. Number three, is it modest? We'll talk about what that means. And then number four, 
dressing neatly, you know, is it neat what you're wearing or, or does it even have to be? What, what's the case? Okay, so number one, look at Genesis chapter three. Number one is, does it cover the nakedness? Now, I have heard a lot of people decide, you know, and you could come up with some definitions in the Bible. Where is nakedness? We know this for sure. The most, the most specific references in the Bible towards nakedness have to do with from the thigh up to the buttocks, right? We understand that. that that's got to be covered. Isn't that pretty much a necessity? I mean, the most pagan uh, religions, you know, around that, that don't have any, any standards, any morals or anything, they wear a loincloth or something, right? There's just some kind of standard. So here's what I want to suggest in your mind. I'm going to do this with, with each point, okay? But let's say on one side of the room, you have got, so in this case, we're dealing with, with covering the nakedness, okay? So excuse me for even like putting this in your mind or being uh, rude, you know, crude or anything like that. But imagine you got somebody over here just completely nude, all right? I mean, that's as, as naked as you could get, right? This somebody's completely nude. And on this uh, side over here, you've got somebody who is the, like, the most covered that you can think of, all right? I mean, let's just go crazy and say they've got a hijab on <laughs> and they got a, you know, they're, they're not showing. I would say probably, you know, the, to the, the wrist, you know, and down to the ankles, whatever, uh, just completely covered. All right. And they're on this side. I've talked to guys, preachers even that said, you know, my mom or my grandma or whatever, I've never seen, you know, any more than her hands up to her wrist. I've never seen anything lower than her neck. I've never seen anything higher than her ankles. I've said that because she was just so concerned about always being covered, right? So let's say that's that grandma or whatever is on one side of the room. And then you got somebody on the other side of the room, completely nude, right? This is nakedness. Covering the nakedness could be anywhere on the spectrum between there and there. Am I right? Does that make just logical sense? <laughs> All right. So let's look at Genesis chapter 3 real quick. Genesis 3, verse 7. <clears throat> and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And you understand this. This is when Adam and Eve first sinned. Now they know the difference between right and wrong, and they say, whoa, this is naked. We should cover our nakedness. And so what they do? They sewed themselves fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, I don't know how long the aprons were. You know, fig leaves, I'm not thinking, are very big. Maybe they were back in the Garden of Eden days. Uh, but they made fig leaves, made aprons, at least covered their most uh, personal places, right, that needed to be covered, let's say. And, you know, thankful for that. They covered themselves. I mean, there's some times in our uh, society in the summertime where you're like, man, <laughs> that's like little more than a fig leaf, right, that somebody's covered themselves with. You know, and there are, believe it or not, our society has absolutely no standards except that they're that much covered. Right. And, and, and to some degree, not even that anymore. You know, and it's uh, it's really crazy. But they they that's just it. Like the bare minimum, like I'm, like you're not here, but you're literally like one step over. Right. And then you got somebody else saying, well, at what point? I would say somewhere in the middle. Right. Somewhere in the middle. One step that way. Ah, you're pretty much, you know, you're pretty much not decent anymore. You need to start trying to think about that. You're you're headed towards nakedness. Does that make sense? Over here, you want to take a step this way. Not saying you got to be covered all the way. Your, no hands are showing or no feet are showing, but but you're you're taking steps towards that way. Then you're more covered. All right. Well, what did God do in the Garden of Eden when they sewed uh, these fig leaves and they made aprons? It says in verse eight, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, Adam and his wife hid themsel themselves in the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the vo thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not to eat? So you understand uh, the story right there. And so he's just saying, Hey, I don't know. All of a sudden I knew I was naked. So he's saying, Ah, you ate of the... Uh, out of the, the tree of life. So look down to, chapter, to verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now we know there's a great 
picture there, you know, being covered in Christ. They tried to cover themselves in fig leaves, you know, that's like their own works or something, and it just barely covered them. But he says, no, you need to be covered. It takes the animal skin. We can make a picture there about uh, the shed blood of Christ, the Lamb of God. And, and I think that it was a great picture for that. But, but I think it's just interesting just to show that, hey, they thought, I, I just need to cover myself. So they put on a fig leaf, right? <laughs> and God said, no, I'm going to put a coat on you. Okay, and so that was kind of a standard that you saw. Uh, after that, there was uh, it was pretty important to be covered. All right, skip down to uh, Genesis nine. Genesis nine, you're probably familiar with this story. After the uh, after Noah's ark, I won't go into detail. Don't even know exactly what happened. Don't even really want to know what happened. But all we know is that uh, Noah gets drunk. And he's naked, all right? And his kids are there, and they notice that he's naked. And you got one kid, Ham, don't know exactly what he does, okay? But he's mocking him, and he's telling his brothers about whatever it was he did. And, uh, and his brothers do this, Genesis 9, verse 23. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Okay, and so regardless of whatever happened there, we see that these two brothers are like, oh, man, that's a shame. That's a shame that he's in that condition. And, and, and if he knew he was in that condition, he'd be embarrassed. He wants to be covered up. And so they literally go backwards with the sheet to cover him, right? They wanted to cover that nakedness. Now look at 2 Samuel 6. 2 Samuel 6, and all throughout the Bible, you'll see that uh, people were naked unto their shame. Um, when they're uncovered, you know, you, you, it it's just always has to do with, with uh, being shame here. 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 20. <clears throat> now, this was a great time, actually, in their history. Uh, you, the Ark of the Covenant was actually going back to Jerusalem. David's excited about that. And David's got on what, the, what is called an, an ephah. Now, I don't know exactly what that was like, but I know it was sort of, it was more like an undergarment or like a tunic or something. It wasn't really all, you know, covering. It certainly wasn't a robe of some sort like that. And we know that just from, even if you didn't know anything else, just by reading the story, look at uh, verse 20. And David returned to bless his household and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And of course, David didn't like that, got offended. And he's saying, hey, I'll do whatever I want to do, basically is what he says. But you see the point, regardless of what was going on in her heart, regardless of how she felt about David, uh, what her problem might have been. She looks at David who's dancing around out there. She doesn't think he's covered enough and he's dancing in front of the women and he's, he's who knows what was showing that shouldn't have been showing or whatever. But he's, but she says, oh, look, you know, you just uncovered yourself and danced around like the vain fellows, right? And so there you see this story where he was not naked. He had an ephah on. He wasn't like over here. He was somewhere between here and there, but it was enough to where she said, he was naked. She felt like he was uncovered. Okay. He said, well, how much covering does somebody have to have to be covered? And how bare do they have to be to be naked? Look at John chapter 21. John This is a great story, and I'm obviously not being exhaustive at all. A lot of stories we could go to on this subject, but when it comes to covering themselves, I find this one interesting. This is, this is uh, Peter, and he's fishing. He's in the boat, not too worried about being decent, you know. Uh, I don't know to what extent he was uncovered, but he's just fishing. He's in the sun. Maybe he's getting a suntan. I don't know what he's doing, but he's in the boat just doing his job, and then they see Jesus. Now, where did I say to go? John 21, verse 7. Uh, Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. 
Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat about unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. Now, typically when people go out of the boat into the water, they strip down, right? But he's going to see Jesus and he says, man, I'm naked. I don't know what he had on, but here in the other, case, in the other story, we saw David had a tunic on and she was accusing him of being uncovered. Uh, I say tunic, ephod on. And so here's what he does. So he gets his, he gets his coat on over whatever he's got on and, he, and he, uh, he, he ties that onto himself. Then he gets out and runs to Jesus, right? Doesn't want to be uncovered or embarrassed of his nakedness in front of Jesus. Sounds like that was a pretty important thing in that culture to be covered. And I would submit to you that's a pretty important thing now. He said, well, exactly what line do I have to cross? Look, here's what I want you to think in your mind, all right? It's your equalizer you're going to have to adjust, right? But here you got over here, nakedness. You got over there, covered. Like, why would you want to stand in the middle and be like, well, how far can I go? <laughs> how far can I go, right? And they asked the preacher, well, is this really naked? I mean, you know, really? I mean, come on, I have this much clothes on. Like, why don't you just try to go as far that way as you can, you know, before, you know, it's... I don't know. Are you going to reach a point where someone says, you know, you're just too covered? You know, I don't understand. You know, I've gone swimming before and felt like in the in whatever the situation was, you know, especially if there's if I'm at the public uh, pool. I don't go to public pool, but uh, like when I was doing lifeguard lifeguard training, though, uh, there would be others there. And so I'd wear a shirt even over my clothes. Right. Just to be completely decent. You know, obviously, some people probably looked at me and said, what? Why has he got a shirt on? I mean, he's in a pool. There's no, not even any sun out here, whatever. Why has he got a shirt on, right? But I bet you nobody said, oh, he's too decent, <laughs> right? Yeah, he's too decent. I mean, I'm offended by how decent he is, right? So I'm not saying you have to have that standard that I do. Uh, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, why would you want to say, well, how close can I get? I mean, is it, can I wear a Speedo or does it have to be, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's kind of weird, but that's exactly how the mentality is in the world. And, uh, man, I really don't have time to share, share uh, uh, this story, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm not going to. It's for the sake of time. So, that, I think that's enough. Uh, that's enough information. Save it for another day. Okay, so, so uh, uh, but anyway, so the first thing we want to consider when it comes to our clothing is are we covering stuff? Now, again, it's not our job to just go around. You know, hey, you're showing too much arm. You know, you're showing your shoulders. You're showing, you know, don't you think you should have sleeves on? Well, you let a person deal with their own standards. You know, you let a, a dad particularly deal with the standards of his household. You let if uh, maybe a church, you say, well, I don't think that pastor ought to let people in that are dressed this way or that way. You know, just let the let other people uh, that are, that w it's their responsibility let them d decide what their standards are. But you be concerned about yourself or your family, whoever you have that, and just ask yourself, well, like, how far, you know, should we, should we go? Where should the standard be? Fathers, there's nothing wrong with you uh, stopping your daughter before she leaves the house and say, no, no, no you need to get some more clothes on, right? That's a, that's a dad's job, I think. Okay, number two, gender specific. Gender specific. Go ahead and turn there, Deuteronomy 22.5. Deuteronomy 22.5. Now, interesting, I checked some commentaries because it's amazing what people now, nowadays will do with this verse. I mean, a lot of them would just flat out say, like, well, it just doesn't apply to us because it was in a different dispensation or something like that. But, uh, but even the ones who are like, well, I was talking about, you know, cross-dressing. But then they'll say, well, it's not even cross-dressing. It's like because of the culture of the day, like certain people cross-dressed for this you know, to, to worship this type of a pagan god or something like that. And they'll just, just go on and on. I don't know where they get their proof for all these things, but they'll go on. But the text is very clear. What is what it says? The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, I looked at uh, some commentary from, like, I, I tried to go back as far as I could, like 1500s at least or something like that, and see what they said about this. And I know if you go back that far, look at pictures of how people dressed, I mean, for the most part, in the 1500s, 1600s, uh, ladies had the dresses on that were like, <laughs> no, 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 
And quite honestly, some of the guys looked a little weird. You know, they had like the long wigs and uh, tights and stuff, whatever, you know. So, uh, so there were different standards. But I just wanted to see what were they thinking about in the commentaries of those days? What were they talking about? And I'm going to tell you, some of them were, were going way like it would really shock people today because it was saying like a, it says there that a woman shouldn't do any, the, uh, put on that which pertaineth unto a man. And so they were saying like a woman shouldn't have a gun. Because, you know, it's the man's job to go out and fight the battles and stuff like that. And the woman shouldn't have, or and the man shouldn't, like, you know, have a, you know, uh, like doing the dishes or what, have an apron on. <laughs> like That's the woman's job. The man shouldn't do what pertains to the, And it was just like just totally keeping the genders distinctly different from each other. Right? right? And, uh, and you can say, well, that's just too far. Okay, but let's do the spectrum. All right? So over here you've got the most feminine lady you can think of, right? I mean, there's nothing about that person that says man or masculine or anything. This is the most feminine lady uh, that you can find. And over here, you got the most manly, rugged, you know, got a beard like, like uh, Brother Nick there, you know, just <laughs> a manly man, right? And he's here. Now, most of the world wants to live right here. In fact, there was a big push to make gender uh, gender neutral clothing, I mean, for a while. I feel like it's a fad that kind of has died out a little bit. I don't know. I, I don't keep up on this that much. But there was a big fad. The people that were making clothes were trying really hard to fit right here so that nobody would be masculine or feminine. They would just be uh, genderless, I guess. And that's, you can see where our culture has just got this weird craze right now about these weird spectrums. I'm like, I'm talking about spectrum, but they're saying like, no, each one of these is a different gender. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. But somewhere in the middle, right, is where all the world wants to go. And here's how that's true. So somebody came up with a genderless clothing, right, and they put billboards up and everything. We don't have gender. And all it was is a dude's sweatsuit, sweat, uh, uh, what is it, like sweatpants and sweatshirt. And women can wear them too. <laughs> it was a man's clothing that a woman could wear, right? Genderless. No, it's not, right? It's just they didn't understand. It's really hard to find this ground, but this is where everybody wants to be, right? The guys can look a little effeminate if you want to th think of it that way, you know, because he's supposed to be over there, but he's actually here. So which direction is he moving? Here, right? He's getting more effeminate, and he's right here. Or the woman, you know, should be way over there, but she's walking as far this way as she can, looking a little bit more masculine, uh, maybe short hair and, and stuff like that. Let's look at some of those verses. <clears throat> you say, short hair, what are you talking about? Well, first of all, could a guy grow his hair out long and it look like a lady's? Yeah, I mean, they could. And you say, well, what, do you, what makes it a lady's? Well, I don't know, but, but uh, I think even nature would show us that there's a difference between a man and a lady. You say, no, I've seen guys with long hair that women would covet after having hair like that. So men can grow their hair that way too. Yeah, but when they do, it's unnatural. It's not right. It looks, it looks weird. Yeah, I should never have to walk down the street and see somebody walking and say, is that a girl or a guy? I can't tell. I should never have to do that. <laughs> but now more than ever, you have to do that. When we worked in the uh, uh, youth ministry, we would have VBS or something like that. And we would say, all right, we want all the boys over here, and we want all the girls over here. And you'd go to someone and say, hey, you're a boy. You're supposed to be over there. Go on that side. And they'd be like, I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. you know. And then later on, I had to say, I'm not really sorry. Because this person has short hair, clothes that look just like a boy. What else would we expect them to be? Right. So this is why it's so weird that the this whole gender thing nowadays in our in our world, it's like if you say the wrong whatever gender they want to be and you call them the wrong thing, they're offended. And it's like, look, you, you got to You look. I mean, if it's a duck, I'm going to call it a duck. Right. If it's, and so uh, so that's the that's the thing we find ourselves in. So look at Revelation 9, 8. I like going to this first here. Revelation 9, 8. This scripture is talking about. These weird beings, these locusts that come out of hell when God's wrath is being poured out on the earth. Revelation 9, 8. And it says in verse 7 that they had faces like men. In verse 8 it says, And they had hair as the hair of a woman, and the teeth as the teeth of lions. Now, you could probably picture in your head what a lion's teeth look like. And say, oh, they must have had teeth like a lion, right? You could probably picture in your head what the face of a man looked like. And when I say the hair of a woman, what can you think? Oh, it must have been nice and soft and silky. <laughs> no. 
everybody's going to look at that and say, oh, they had long hair, right? Long hair. Now look at 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is stuff that we need to be able to show and understand. And, and uh, trust me, it, we, you will stand out in this world if you believe this stuff and, and, and act upon it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 14. I tell all these kids, all these kids want to be different, right? It's like, well, I just want to be different. And they're actually being just like one, each other, like whoever their group is, that's what they're being like, right? I'm like, you just follow the Bible, man. You're going to stand out. You're going to be set apart, separate from the world <laughs> if you want to be different. All right, where was I? First Corinthians 11, verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. Now, you can sit there, and this is what everybody would do. If I just posted that scripture, this is what I did with Deuteronomy 22.5. I just posted a scripture. And it wasn't like the lost people who were saying, what weird stuff is this Bible teaching? It wasn't the people who are saved and love the Lord and want to know what the Lord has for them in their life. It was the Christians who called themselves Christians but want to do whatever they want to do that came out of the woodwork and said, you know, well, you got to read the whole chapter. I can read the whole chapter if you want me to, but when I read that verse, it says a man shouldn't wear that garment of a woman and a woman shouldn't wear that which pertaineth unto a man. You can't change that. I mean, I, I don't care how you want to define it. That means something. And it says whoever does that and is abomination. That means something. That means wherever the spectrum is where you got femininity here and you got masculinity over there, Men should be on that side. Women should be on this side. Right. Okay? Right. And I don't care how you want to define that. Yeah, but you're talking about pants. Well, see, there you go. You're like, well, how close can I get? Right? right. Hey, just take another step this way. Yeah. And that's all that you really care about. It's just like, what can I get away with? It's not like, well, well what would please God? Right. What would make me look, look more like a lady? What would make me look more like a man? Right. You know? <clears throat> and so, uh, so when it comes to hair, it's the same thing. And it's interesting because the Bible talks about the hair being like for a lady for a covering. Now, I'll say this. When it comes to femininity, again, I'm not going through the Bible. I'm not taking you back to ancient times and pulling out these artifacts and say, well, let's see how people dressed during those days or not. I'm just saying, let's use some common sense. You've got male and you've got female, right? You've got, uh, like I said, you've got one person walking down the street and you say, is that a man or a woman? I should, you know, how about if it has short hair? And it's got the attire of a man, right? You say, well, that's probably a man. And somebody says, oh, yeah, well, they make, they make uh, ladies' suit pants, you know, that are a feminine cut and all that kind of stuff. All right, maybe there are feminine pants out there, right? But why do you want to see how far you can get to this side, right? And I, I'm, I'm just trying to stay away from, like, going down the, some of the, like, common things that we preach on and try to, you know. I'm just trying to use common sense for just somebody who would just say, well, I want to be the gender God made me to be, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> so it says the same thing about the hair. And I find this interesting, the covering thing. So I think a woman's hair, I think everybody would agree, especially if you read the context here of uh, 1 Corinthians 11, that hair is given for a covering. And I don't think it's talking about wearing a hat, right, for a covering. It's just simply saying that your hair is a covering. And it's a glory to the woman, but it also talks about it in a way that it's a submission to the man, Right? The man is the head of the woman. And it's saying that by her having long hair, it shows a type of submission. Do you, do you kind of catch, catch that? Now, common sense should be able to tell us. We should look around and say, if I see a woman with long hair, doesn't she typically look a little more like a submissive woman than someone who's cut their hair off? When I see a woman who's cut their hair off, usually I see somebody who's a little rebellious like trying to just come out and be, and, then, and you'll see that. I remember I used to watch movies, and I can't think of any by name, but movies where like the figure, like she was treated bad by all these men, and so she kind of like becomes the feminist like hero of the movie, and she always cuts her hair off, right? And then wants to, and then all of a sudden, like the, her whole demeanor and action, it's like her, <laughs> you know, because she cut her hair off, and she's like being a man, and, and you know, we can do it. We're women, hear us roar. And, uh, and what that does is that takes away the, the submission of a, that a God made a woman to, to have. 
Now, I believe that a woman naturally wants to fight against that to some degree. And, uh, and so just like a man's going to have certain things that they got to fight and constantly be like, oh, yeah, I got to be the leader of the household. <laughs> when given to ourselves, we're just kind of like, I don't care. Let you do it. You know, you do it. But the men have to say, no, I got to step up and be a leader. Women a lot of times want to uh, take a leadership role. They want to overstep their bounds when it comes to uh, submission. And, uh, and so that I'm talking about naturally. So they have to fight that and walk in the spirit and say, God, help me be a submissive woman. The Bible has a lot to say about that. So when it comes to uh, the types of clothes we wear, we, you know, I, I don't know how much I need to labor on this. Probably don't. But uh, so, you know, you're talking about different types of clothes. You're around your house. You're in comfy clothes. Look at your own business, how you want to dress. Uh, you know, I would suggest that you keep in mind if you have children, you know, that the rules still apply. Your children are still being exposed to nakedness, for instance. Your still, children are still being exposed to uh, femininity, masculinity. And so whether it's comfy clothes, plain clothes, every day somebody's going to see you, you know, you want to keep these things in mind. If it's your work clothes, I remember Valerie got a job at, a, at Taco Bell when she was a teenager. And her and she was she's always had strong conviction that women need to wear uh, skirts, or dresses, and not wear pants. And so she told that to her boss. Her boss was actually going to our church at the time. This was many years ago. And uh, and so he was he was like, hey, you know, you wear the skirts, everything. That's great. Not have any problem with that. And then she had some lady manager that came in sometime, corporate or something like that. He's coming to check on everybody. He says, what's she doing wearing a skirt? Like our attire, like our dress code is, he's supposed to be wearing pants. And he was like, you leave her alone. She's the best worker I've got. <laughs> and, she's a, and all the people come in and say how, you know, how good of a job she's doing and all that. And so she had to kind of fight that a little bit, fight some of the ridicule and all that stuff. But it was because she was saying, well, number one, that was what her mom and dad requ required of her. And then she was saying, like, I want to do what's pleasing to the Lord. And she's saying, I want to be a lady and I want to be covered. And I want to. And these are the convictions that sometimes you have to stand for, even whenever it's a little uncomfortable. People always say, well, have you tried to go shop for long, uh, decent skirts and dresses for your lady? I mean, for your daughter or whatever. And uh, and they'll say, you can't find them anywhere out there. Well, here's the funny thing about that. I mean, I don't know. That's probably true. But here's the funny thing about that. Target of all places. You know, right across the street from where we uh, meet for soul winning, we've gone to that Target a few times, and we were always told told that Target was like, like going into like this gender blurring thing, and there, there's no doubt about it. There's some freaks in Target, but <laughs> but we went into Target, and my wife was like just blown away by all the skirts and the dresses. I don't know if those are for men to wear or what, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. But she said, "Wow, this Target's actually got some nice." Uh, so I mean, it's out there. You know, there's still ladies that want to be feminine, and there's still ladies who, who dress away. And if not, guess what? There are a lot of Christians who, who make that stuff, and you can buy it and get it shipped to you online. But, uh, but I think you should set some standards for yourself to be there. I'm not going to go around judging people by the way that they, they dress, but these are just things that we should consider in the Bible. Go ahead. So the third one is this. I'm going to try to rush here. The third one is modesty. Now, you might say, well, modesty, we just talked about modesty, being covered, being clothed, and all that. Now, actually, modesty has to do with being, uh, not being flashy, or another word that somebody might use is flamboyant, like standing out. Just, you want everybody to see, maybe you got the sparkly sequins, you know, or you got bright colors, or you got all this kind of, and I'm not trying to say don't wear a bright color shirt, I'm just saying, listen to me, <laughs> you're not flashy trying to get all the attention wearing all the latest trends and trying to just wear, you know, uh, the first thing I thought about was wearing hat ba hats backwards. Like, I don't really care if you wear a hat backwards, but, you know, when the big trend started, it was just kind of like a sign of rebellion. And it was like, oh, I got to wear my hat backwards because all the other kids are doing it or whatever. And uh, it's just something that you're doing that's just, I want to attract attention. I want to be weird. I want to stand out. I want to do something. And actually, the Bible says you shouldn't be trying to draw attention to yourself. Everything you do in your life should be trying to deflect that attention and put it on to the Lord. And so you shouldn't live your life trying to draw attention. Hey, look at me. Hey, look how flashy I am. Look how, how, how great I look. Bible calls, uh, this is interesting. Look at James chapter 2. And by the way, 1 Timothy 2, 9 is a great verse about ladies dressing in modest apparel. And it even talks about that shamefacedness. And I think it's just the idea of saying, hey, I'm in subjection. I'm, I'm, 
I'm not trying to, uh, not trying to like get all the attention to myself and like show that I'm a man and I'm, uh, I mean I'm I'm a leader and all that kind of stuff. Just being uh, modest. Now where was I? James chapter two. Here's another word for flamboyant clothing. Are you ready? James chapter two verse three. Uh, verse 2, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have uns uh, respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit, there, uh, sit thou here in uh, a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? So the idea here is you got somebody comes in and they've just got all this rich, nice, fancy clothing, top of the line, you know, everything is, uh, is the name brand kind of stuff, and they got the rings and the flashy things and probably bright garments and clothing, uh, and the Bible calls it gay apparel. So you got the gay apparel over here. I want to stay as far away from the gay. <laughs> I'm just, you got the gay apparel over here, right? This is flamboyant. This is rich. This is all the nice stuff. Name brand looks the best. Now, look, if you buy something name brand because it's a better quality, it lasts longer, I'm all for it, right? Uh, it's actually you save money sometimes buying the right, buying a good quality uh, brand as opposed to buying, you know, just Walmart stuff or whatever. But if you're just, I just got to have the name brand. I don't care how much it costs. It just, everyone likes it and it makes, you know, stands out. They look at me and I got all the flashy clothes and the rings and the jewelry and all that kind of stuff. If you just get like the, the person that's the most gaudy, flashy, flamboyant person you can think of, put them here. And then you got the person over here, just the plain clothes, you know, almost like Amish looking or whatever. <laughs> Amish could be that way, too, when they start drawing attention to themselves with the with the, the hat and like, oh, I got the religious clothing on. That's bad, too. OK, but what I'm talking about, somebody who just dressed plainly, not trying to draw attention to themselves. But you might say, like, but I don't want to look that bad. I mean, maybe I can come that way. Well, fine. You can choose wherever you want to go. That's your own personal convictions or your husband or whoever's a, your authority, children, your parents going to tell you what, where you can fit. But why do you want to just go as far as I can? Well, this isn't too flashy. Like, this isn't too gaudy. Like, I can do this. A little I can be flamboyant like this, right? No, just try to do the best that you can to be what God wants you to be and be pleasing to him. All right, I, wanted to, I went through that one real fast. Now, the last one, I'm just going to say a few things about. And, uh, and my wife will laugh about this one, but dressing neatly. <laughs> Not dressing sloppy, okay? You got on this, on this side, you got somebody who is dressed. Here's how I've heard it, say, I've heard it said this way, like, like somebody just got pitched, like a hitchhiker that just got picked up off the streets, right? Hitchhiking, and he looks uh, just sloppy, gruffy, you know, all that. That's, that's the idea. And then you got somebody who's, uh, who is neat, clean, everything's in place, trimmed, and all that. Now, look, I, you, you know me well enough to know I'm not the super, you know, just fancy. I mean, I got stains on here, stain right there. I mean, I wore white socks for Pete's sake. I mean, it's not so important <laughs> to me to just, I didn't shave today, right? I don't care about just being like 100%. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I think, I think that's a little masculine to like not be like completely meticulous and everything you know, manicured and just, I think that's a little effeminate, right? But at the same time, I don't want to be a slob. I'm representing the Lord. I don't want, I want to be uh, neat, you know? Uh, let's look at uh, Exodus 19. At home, probably not going to worry too much about it, although it would be kind of nice for my wife to want to look at me every once in a while, so I might try to wash up a little bit. <laughs> but uh, at work, you know, depending on what I'm doing, if I'm studying all day, I'm probably not too worried about it, but somebody might drop in and want to visit, you know, and they, they might not really like to see their pastor jump, dressed like a bum, which I've been known to do from time to time. Exodus chapter 19. My, uh, my wife's grandpa, Brother A.F. Collins, he would, uh, when he went fishing, he would have a suit on. <laughs> I kid you not. He'd go fishing in a suit. He had like several different suits, but if he was going fishing, he'd wear this suit. Right? He wouldn't mind getting a little wet or whatever. 
but it was just in case he got a call from somebody that wanted him to visit him in the hospital or something like that. He just stopped what he was doing and just go straight there and he's got a suit on. <laughs> I'm like, man, those were, those were the days, right? <clears throat> All right, where did I say? I already forgot. Exodus 19, look at verse 14. Now the children of Israel are, or Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel are getting them uh, through him. And uh, God tells Moses this right before he's going to meet with them and show up. He says this, Exodus 19, verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people. God had told him to do this, by the way. And they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning. There were thunders and lightnings, and, and it goes on. So the idea was, hey, this is holy a holy time we're going to meet with god this is a special time so he said wash your clothes you know sanctify yourselves get cleaned up get straightened up comb your hair brush your teeth basically right i mean i know it didn't i'm reading into it but he's saying you're getting ready to meet with the lord and it amazes me to see this trend at churches contemporary churches that are like getting away from just come just come as you are. And I appreciate that if you're just saying, hey, you can come however you are, and I'm still going to minister to you, still going to get the gospel. I'm not going to say, hey, you go sit in the back, and I'm going to take this other guy in the nice clothes and sit him in the front. We understand James was saying that that's bad. Okay, we don't, we, We're not going to respect people in that way. But all ourselves as a responsibility, if we're going to go and we're going to stand before God and worship God together and sing praises to God together, we ought to take a little bit of time and maybe not dress like we're at home wearing our comfy clothes, probably not even dress like we're wearing our plain clothes on the street, probably not even wearing work clothes necessarily, unless we're getting ready to go to work right afterwards. I understand that, right? Uh, but probably we're going to dress up a little bit. Now, you don't have to wear the nicest, you know, uh, you know fall into the line of being, uh, uh, you know, flamboyant or whatever, you know. But just wear your best. You're doing it for the Lord. You're not doing it, you know, oh, I hate ties, though. They're so uncomfortable, right? Yeah, just do, it's, it's an hour, you know. Just wear a tie. I mean, you don't have to wear a tie. I'm not telling you that. I'm just saying you choose where your standards are, but say, say when it comes to serving the Lord, I'm going to pick it up a notch, okay? Uh, but now what was I talking about? Being Okay, so we're talking about being neat. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. This might seem like a stretch, but hear me out here. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 27. Well, back up to 20, uh, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Uh, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, look at this, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives. And it goes on, but here's the point I'm saying. We understand there's a spiritual application. Jesus wanted to present his church as something that's chaste and holy and clean and, 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 it's, and it's right before God, right? But what he's using as an illustration, as a picture of what he wants to present to the Lord is something that's without spot, without wrinkle, something that's clean. So you understand if he's going to use that as an illustration, he's saying that's a good thing to present. That's what is, that's what is good, right? So we want to be people who keep ourselves clean unspotted now obviously it's more important to be unspotted from the world but we need to be try to be unspotted be clean be uh, 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 be without wrinkle right now it helps if you got a wife or someone that can can iron for you but if you can't you know just get a spray bottle and spray down the wrinkles or something <laughs> just try to make a little bit of a chance in fact it might even help you get a wife if you can uh, uh, start trying to look a little neater <laughs> just tasting didn't work for me. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have to do it. I'm just kidding. So uh, Matthew chapter 23. I actually probably paid a whole lot more attention to my looks back then. <laughs> hey, women are supposed to be silent in the church. Matthew 23. 
In verse 26. Here's the last verse, and I'm going to close. Twenty-three. Let's look at twenty-five. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of your cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortions and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, clean first that which is within the cup and platter, and uh, uh, that of the outside then may be clean also. So you understand the spiritual application, okay? And he's saying. You know, it's just kind of like the, uh, the picture he gives of the whited sepulchers. You know, they're dead bones inside, nasty, but on the outside it's all painted white and looking pretty and stuff like that. And he's saying the same thing about these cups. He's saying, you know, they wash the outside of the cups, but really the inside is gross and vile and, and, and bad. And so what he's saying is it's most important to clean the inside of the cup, right? And then clean the outside also, and then so that the whole thing will be clean. And uh, here's the thing that the world will say a lot of times. I say the world. Here's the things a lot of Christians will even say. They'll say, look, the outward doesn't matter. Just the inside, the inside is what matters, right? Now, that's true in the sense of this. God sees the heart. God knows what's inside, and he's going to judge us according to what's on inside, not outside. He doesn't look according to the appearance. But we look on the outside appearance, so somebody will say, well, it doesn't matter what a person wears. It doesn't matter what a person does, what they say, how their speech is or whatever. It only matters what's in the heart. But yeah, but here's the thing. We can't see what's in the heart. But what we see on the outside is probably, probably a good representation of what is actually going on on the inside. Because what's going on inside comes out in our speech, comes out in the way we act, comes out in our behavior, even comes out in the way that we dress. Right. So if you see somebody now, I don't know what their heart's like on the inside, but you see them and it says that nah, looks like someone who cares about the way they present themselves. They try to stay covered and not be uh, walk around naked. They try to look like the gender which God made them to look like. They try to uh, look neat and respectable. They try to be modest, not flashy, flamboyant. I couldn't remember that point. And so. We can probably suspect, I mean, don't do it to impress me, but I'm just saying we can probably expect somebody who's got that right on the outside, probably right on the inside. So that's what we want to do. Work on the outside, yes, but all those things on the outside do matter in the sense that that's what people see. They don't see what's on the inside. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and the, uh, the challenge uh, that we might do all that we can to be pleasing to you and not see how far we can get away from... Uh, uh, what, we, what, what should be our standards, and, uh, and I pray you help us actually, our, uh, actually have higher standards, not for the wrong reasons, but that we would try to grow closer to you and to not offend and to be um, holy people set apart for your use, Lord. And uh, I pray that you help us be useful as a church and individually and that you'd be glorified by what we do. Lord, we, give, we want to magnify you and lift up your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.